don't forget that as Christians and believers, we're the bride of Christ. And he is, not he's going to be, he is today the King of kings and Lord of lords. He holds all authority and all power in his hand. He holds in his hand the keys, the power over death, hell, and the grave. And the scripture teaches that he is in heaven as his enemies are being made his footstool. You and I, our lives, the scripture says, are like smoke and dust. And that our ashes of flesh will return back to ash. And eternal God sometimes don't get in a hurry the way that you and I do. We feel the pressure of a time and space world. We feel the pressure knowing that our days are numbered. Uh, He does not feel that pressure. When you're an eternal God, you can beat most of your enemies just by waiting them out. You say, well, I've been waiting a long time, preacher. We'll wait a little longer. The scripture says, having done all to stand, keep on standing. Because he is going to have his way in the end. But I want to submit to you this idea. He will have his way. He's asking you and I, as his church, as his bride, to take our place at his side. The Apostle Paul uses this language, and I love it because it's so accurate. The desire of the Lord is not to sit in heaven watching the movie of planet Earth play out while he snacks on popcorn and gets a foot massage from little fat baby cherubim rubbing his feet, plucking a heart. I hate to break it to you, but that is not what the throne room of heaven looks like. His most earnest desire is that he win the victory for us. But then he, he partners with us and we become co-laborers with him to do what? His absolute favorite thing. Create. Create. He wants to work with us to create the world that we are living in today and to create the world that our children and our children's children will live in tomorrow. How do I know this? Because God is a generational God from the very beginning until the very end. He is constantly speaking of fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, and he speaks of generation to generation, sons to sons to sons. He speaks. Perhaps one of the most magnanimous examples in the Old Testament is when he began to lay down the law of the Old Testament and he said, I will visit the sins of fathers onto their sons for three generations. And so it's at that time he begins to clearly point out that what daddies do are going to affect their sons and their grandsons and their great-grandsons. And you and I, I don't know about you, but when I read that as a father, I feel a bit of holy fear and trembling come on my life. And I start going, oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me. And so that can become overwhelming. But God says, your wickedness will be visited to the third generation, but I will visit blessing to the thousandth generation. So you can't out-wicked God's blessing. The scripture says that mercy triumphs over judgment and so our daddies may have messed up our grandpas may have messed up you may have messed up I certainly have messed up but I need not be afraid because his blessing will surely overtake us And he kept his word when he sent his son to reverse the power of sin and death. His son also came to repeal the Old Testament, Old Covenant law. And so now we're no longer Jew and Gentile struggling under these difficult laws. Now we are sons and daughters of inheritance by faith. And so that simply means this. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to produce it. 
you for sure don't have to be born into it. You can be Jew, you can be Gentile, you can be white, black, any color in between. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be Democrat, you can be Republican. It don't matter who you are, what you are, where you come from, by faith in you. Something in your heart can spark to life and you can say, I believe in Jesus, the King of Kings, the just judge of all the nations who carries the government on his shoulders. And by faith, I am believing that his blessing is the final word over our life. You can become an inheritor by faith. And then his victory becomes your victory. His inheritance becomes mine and your inheritance. His privilege and favor becomes our privilege and favor. And because of this, he can co-create and co-labor with us. With these things in mind, there's a morality that is attached to the blessing. There's a morality that is attached to being an inheritor. There is a morality that is attached to being the bride of Christ and to being a son of the Most High God. I know a lot of believers, and I've even been guilty of it, especially in my younger years, where I knew I was saved and blood-bought and filled with the Holy Ghost, but still wanted to go live like hell when I felt like it. There was a lot of time in my life where I come to church every Sunday, but I was the most selfish Sorry, I had to filter adjectives there. <laughs> I was the most selfish son of sassafras there ever was. <laughs> Walk out the door, I didn't care nothing about what my daddy, the preacher, had just said. I wanted to care about me. I wanted to care about my girlfriend and my truck and the, my money in my pocket. The scripture says this, that when I was a child, I thought like a child and I spoke like a child. But then when I became a man, I had to put away childish things. I come hunting today and I come believing that there are some believers in this room that you may have been living like a little child Christian, whether you knew it or whether you didn't. But I'm putting out a call today. I'm looking for some believers who are willing to set aside childish things, to take their place, to pick up the mantle, to assume the call, and to become mature sons and daughters. Let's quit messing around and selfish blessing. Let's quit messing around in trivial pursuit. Let's quit giving our things that don't produce life. Let's leave that behind. Let's pick ourselves up, orient ourselves in the direction of the true son, and let's become everything that God has called and purposed us to be. You say, well, what are you talking about? I, that sounds great, but what is it? How do I know it when I see it? How do I know I'm on the right path? I think one of the reasons that the church that most of us have known, the Western American church, has become so impotent, and it has become a collection of goats and wolves, The reason how come the world mocks us and the reason how come we have become a voting block to politicians instead of the force of life change on this planet is because we have fallen into one-dimensional, one-generational, selfish Christianity. Because we get up on Sunday morning and all we can think about is getting our blessing instead of asking the Lord, what do you want me to build? We curse our families when, we, when as parents we become more concerned about us as parents than what we're leaving our children. The scripture says that a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children. I want to submit to you what I believe will ultimately be a controversial idea to the church. And that is that when he wrote that scripture, he was not just talking about did you leave a piece of your 401k to little Johnny and little Susie. I believe he was exerting a spiritual principle that 
says this, you need to leave something to your children that's far more potent than money and a little bit of real estate. You need to leave to your children an inheritance. You need to leave to your children a spiritual calling, a spiritual mantle, a spiritual place that they are to grow up and step into because we're not just here on this world to be blessed and grow fat on spiritual blessing and then die and go to heaven. He put us on this world to create something new because he said, behold, I make all things new. If he has made us sons and daughters, kings and queens, then part of the purpose and assignment of that calling is that we will secure today and secure tomorrow. And so with this in mind, we have to think about this passage from Esther metaphorically. And so you and I are not sitting in the halls of the Senate today with a pen, physically, literally writing new laws. So we must think about this principle metaphorically. I don't know about you, sometimes I don't know if I, want, I would want the responsibility of writing laws. That, that's a very daunting task. So then what am I talking about? If we're going to speak in metaphor, we need to make it plain. I believe that God is asking you personally in your personal life, in your homes and in your families, I believe that he's asking you to write new laws, Amen. new laws to live by. And I believe that he's asking the gate church to exercise our authority and to utilize the crown that we have been given, that place of authority and favor. He's asking us to write new laws for our house and by proxy for our city. Let me just go ahead and help you with this. Whatever new, rise, new laws we write in this church are not for our four and no more because with every new law, there's an open invitation that whosoever will come can come and inherit the same prosperity that we inherit. I think that we, like Esther and Mordecai, must be wise and understand the significance of our moment. Because they have succeeded. Haman's dead. Our enemy is dead. And his plan has been foiled. That's good. That is great. God starts getting really excited when you use the position you have today to bless people into the future. I read a quote once that went something like this. It's a wise man who plants trees today under which shade he will never sit. Let me break it down for you like this. There are new levels of influence, prosperity, authority, and blessing that come into your life today when you determine this. I will use what I have today to build and establish something for the future, and I may not even be there. And I need to let you know that that's far more than concrete and wood buildings. What we're really talking about are spiritual things. And so now we're creeping up on something very interesting and very potent. If we want to drink from, be filled with, and to share God's new wine of the Spirit, that I believe we're in an age where God is pouring out new wine, then here is how we will gain access to that new wine. When we step up and say this, we don't bring your nasty old Stanley cup that's got mildew growing in it, because that's your old wine skin. That's your old way of thinking, choosing, feeling, and doing things. We're going to have to throw that away and say, God, do something new today. God, I'm not going to put it off on my children to let them pay the bill. I'm not going to leave enemies in my land for them to fight. God, use me today. Let me be the one that struggles and strives and the one that i got to take hold of the horns of the altar and contend and pray and believe. Lord, give me the strength to run off the enemies so that they can live in houses that they didn't build and they can eat from vineyards that they didn't have to plant. 
God, if you're going to give blessing, give me some blessing so I can use it to build for them that comes behind me. That's a new wineskin. That's a new way of thinking that God says, okay, you pick that up, I'll start giving you prosperity. I'll start giving you strength. I'll start giving you anointing. I'll start giving you favor because I like to build things for the next generation. Yes. 